Buzz gone? <laughs> Should we proceed? <laughs> What's the matter? We'll have to proceed. What's happening? <laughs> we Are thought we that, uh, He's got a buzz in the audio, but we're just going to have to proceed. Oh, no. um, okay. Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. And I'm really honored to have as my guest today here at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San, hey, San Jose, California, Dr. Robert Thurman. Um, Robert is the key, uh, Jay Zong Karp, Kappa Professor, sorry, of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies in the Department of Religion at Columbia University. He's president of the Tibet House U.S., a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and promotion of Tibetan civilization, and president of the American Institute of Buddhist Studies. <clears throat> That's just enough. That's enough. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, um, very, not very awakened, also. Okay, here's Dana's another. Dana's more awakened than me. Oh, yeah. Here's another way of introducing him. I was riding my bike through the park the other day, and I, I ran into an old friend, and, and I told her I was coming to this conference, and, and uh, I s mentioned a few people I was going to be interviewing, and I, I said, um, Bob Thurman, and she said, Oh, Uma's father. <laughs> You're so lucky. That's amazing. <laughs> That's most important. <laughs> yes. Um, so. One more little tid, embarrassing tidbit, a little bit more uh -oh. flattery here. Um, Time chose Professor Thurman, Time Magazine chose him as one of the 25 most influential Americans in 1997, describing him as a larger-than-life scholar-activist destined to convey the Dharma, the precious teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, from Asia to America. And the New York Times recently said Thurman is considered the leading American expert on Tibetan Buddhism. So thank, thank you very much for doing this. Thanks. Now, let's start out on a personal note. You know, a lot of us were wild and crazy teenagers. Um, yes. I certainly was. Uh, I ha must have had given my guardian angels nervous breakdowns. And uh, <laughs> you ended up, I, 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 don't, I didn't hear exactly what happened to you, but you ended up being wild and crazy and having, losing an eye when you yes. were a young man. And it kind of turned your life around. It did. So talk it, about that a little bit. My old Mongolian uh, teacher told me that whenever I was asked about it, I should say, that I lost one eye and gained a thousand. He said, don't be embarrassed, just say it. He said, meaning the eyes of the Dharma, that is, you know. And of course, Avalokiteshvara, you know, the Bodhisattva of Universal Compassion, which Omani Bemehom is his mantra. Um, his and her mantra, Tara, is also the same. Um, he has the thousand arms, you know, with the eyes in the palm of each hand to indicate wisdom and compassion both, you know, reaching into. But I'm not like that, but I'm just working, I'm working for it. I'm around the feet of that entity. Right. Dalai Lama is really like that, and I try to help him. Good. Oh, and I forgot to introduce my friend Dana Sawyer, who's sitting here. Um, I interviewed Dana yesterday about talking about Houston Smith, and I invited Dana to help me interview Robert because... Um, Dana's wisdom and, and understanding of the types of things that Robert is conversant with far exceeds mine. I thought it might be a richer interview if we both did it. Um, and feel free well, to chime in anytime. It exceeds mine in terms of Tibetan Buddhism. I know a lot about Tibetan Buddhism, but Robert knows a lot. Yeah. He's in the big leagues. <laughs> He's the guy. Right. It, I am not worthy to be bowing. Oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. So, uh, so after that eye injury, and you went to India, and this and that happened, and you ended up going and learning Tibetan in about 10 weeks or something, as I understand it, fluently? Well, I'm still trying to learn Tibetan. Mm. You know, it goes on for life. It's a huge, huge civilization, because what Tibet has is it, it's the repository, the, the sanctum of the 1,500 years of Indian Buddhism that was lost in India when, with the destruction of all the Buddhist libraries, the Buddhist monastery, monastic universities, and so on, such as Nalanda. 
And uh, Tibet has preserved that, including the curriculum and the living transmission and so forth. So although it was a country of a small number of people, around 20 million at some point, and then we decreased to around six or seven million due to the wonderful birth control properties of monasticism. <laughs> uh, very nice thing to keep a balanced population is uh, take some people out of the reproductive pool yeah. and let them reproduce in some sort of dharmic way. You know? And uh, so it's an amazing thing. But I was fluently speaking in mm. about uh, 10 weeks, and I was already annoying some of the Tibetan scholars at the place monastery where I live. <laughs> if I wanted to argue and debate with them about emptiness and selflessness and all of this sort of thing. And uh, so it was, it was like a duck to water, absolutely. And you became a Tibetan la Lama. You were ordained as one. I did. I was ordained. Well, Lama doesn't mean monk. Uh, Tibetan gelong, which is the word for bhikshu. Lama means a teacher. Mm. And uh, there are some lay teachers as well as monastic teachers. And I became a monk against the advice of my original guru, mm -hmm. who said, you, I know you want to be a monk, you're very sincere, you know that that's a way to a lifelong free lunch, but, <laughs> and you can study the whole time, but you know, you're not going to be able to stay a monk, I can predict it's not your destiny, your karma. And then I kept bugging him, bugging him, so he took me to Dalai Lama, and he told Dalai Lama, this boy is good, he wants to study, blah, blah, blah. But uh, don't make him a monk, because he will not be able to stay as a monk. But who am I? I'm just an old monk. Only well, you're the Dalai Lama. You decide. Mm -hmm. So then Dalai Lama did make me a monk after a while. And then I was a monk for three or four years. And then um, I, um, he was, my original guru was correct. Dalai Lama was too young, and I was too young. And came back here in the mid-60s. And uh, you know, monks at that time were burning themselves to try to stop the Vietnam War. You know? So my activism you know, emerged. And uh, I, I would re resign. And, and luckily, I resigned just in time to meet the love of my life, my, who has been my wife now for 49 years. And um, then Uma came to visit us along with three boys to be a, driving her chariot. <laughs> <laughs> and so what was the activism that you, you said you, you came back and you played uh, Well, you know, that the was the middle, middle of 60s was civil rights movement and okay. anti-war movement. Yeah. And I was deeply engaged in both. Uh, I left high school, which you did a mention before. Uh, I was in a prep school, you know, at Phillips Exeter, actually. And in my senior year, I left high school to join Fidel Castro's revolution. But luckily for me, they wouldn't accept my, my recruitment because I was 17, you know, and I was 6'3", 145 pounds. And I was with a Mexican guy who was 5'3", 175 pounds. So they said, Don Quixote and Sancho Panza have arrived. <laughs> and... Uh, but maybe, maybe you have your head blown off in five minutes, so maybe you could do help us some other way, you know. Thank goodness, or I would be dead, you know, at this time. But I always had a wish to change this world, you know, and uh, which I retain and which Buddhism has helped to foster. And I haven't given up hope that it, we will be changing it, and I think we are changing it. And I followed Dalai Lama's idea that 21st century has to be a less violent century or a non-violent century, a century of dialogue in spite of the coup d'etat in our American country in the year 2000 that caused a ridiculous waste of everything for those 15 years since. And uh, that, that can be repaired, I think, and we will, we will move ahead, I hope. These days, I believe so. I, I often hear you, say, in, you know, clarify when you speak publicly that you're not, you don't consider yourself enlightened or awakened or anything, That's right. anything like that. And uh, as I understand it, no... True blue. I'm too scared of my wife to go around proclaiming. Yeah, she'll I kick you out of the house. <laughs> and my children. <laughs> um, but, you know, these days, especially uh, conferences like this, there are all sorts of people that are referred to their awakening rather matter-of-factly. Oh, I had my awakening in 2006, and right. then I had another one in 2008. So how do you um, relate to that? How do you, what do you think they're saying? Uh, do, do, have they well, got something you don't have? Or first, is, first thing I want to say is I'm, I awaken every morning. <laughs> Unfortunately, I do. And uh, second, and so do they. And second, of course, there are degrees of awakening. You have epiphanies and moments of understanding. But the way that I have been studying the Buddhist sciences for a long period of time, the definition of what really full enlightenment is, is very, very advanced and exalted. And, and that is uh, a problem, A. And maybe generically even, you know, in Zen, for example, they feel that someone who has an experience 
of disappearing, of melting into emptiness, or what they think of as melting into emptiness, and then thinks that was the ultimate experience, and they're like really done, you know, just all set, just wait till they die, and then they'll stay there. Uh, they are trapped in the demon ghost cave, they say. Because, you know, if you think, if you go around thinking you're enlightened, you're in the terrible problem of you have to fart Chanel number five. <laughs> I'm sorry, I hope you, you can censor it if you want. But, but it's too silly, you know, unless, of course, you have a definition of enlightenment, that enlightenment is just being resigned to being really ordinary, which is actually another misunderstanding, I believe. In That's Buddhist a, understanding, Buddhist traditional understanding, yes. is, is it kind of recognized that there can be a tendency for various stages of awakening to be so uh, gratifying or so, to, to feel so complete that one feels one is done? Absolutely. Absolutely, and therefore the, the protection against that, the immunization against that is the understanding, the inferential, philosophical, critically rational understanding of emptiness, which is called the royal reason of relativity. In other words, anything that a relative being can experience is relative, and therefore it cannot be an absolute state. So there is no state of enlightenment, something like that, but there is somehow this very strange thing that is inexpressible, and you know, like non-duality, where you have to maintain silence, etc., because it's inexpressible and inconceivable and unthinkable, and therefore they talk about it all the time, you know, with vast reams of texts and literature, but it's a pure negation, you know. It's a negation, it's an opening the mind like a negational understanding. And then I think the, the enlightened state is something very complex, actually, rather than we would, we sort of think, you know, we're sort of a Wake, and then we're sound asleep and unconscious and we think it must be one or the other and mostly we think it's something like being unconscious because that's the time when we get some rest you know and nobody bugs us temporarily you know except in a dream maybe and uh, whereas the enlightened state I think is where someone realizes the, re the, the sort of absolute relativity and so therefore they experience the relativity sort of like you would experience living in a mirror surface and the mirror surface is this incredibly complicated thing, including everybody else's body and mind and everything in the universe and the galaxy and the multi-galaxy and time and space, and yet being interrelated with specific differentiated things at the same time. But that interrelatedness in the specific differentiated things is like as if you were you know, looking at your you know, shaving in the mirror or putting on your face, if you're a female, in a mirror where you shift left and right without thinking. You have an intuitive awareness that each of these things that seems to be a thing in itself is actually empty of anything in itselfness. So it's a complicated cognitive dissonance transcending or tolerating or maintaining or sustaining or whatever you want to say. Since you can't say anything, you can say a lot of things. And uh, it's that kind of awareness. By definition, I know. I don't, I don't know it. I don't claim to know it completely by experience, but some taste of that, you know. And that's why I said this morning, that's my consolation to myself and to people who ask me, are you enlightened after 50 years or more of study and, and, and experience and meditating and being a monk and everything? If you say, Abs no, absolutely not, which would be true, then they get very discouraged. They think, what's the use for me? Why you know? don't bother? Yeah. yeah, what's the point, you know? And then if you say yes, then they go like, huh, and then they think you are and they aren't. <laughs> and so middle way there is what I call my consolation prize, which I'm very pleased with, which I got from looking at family family, uh, you know, pictures, you know, of uh, what we call memory lane on Thanksgiving dinner or, you know, whatever it is, memory lane, you know, where you look at those things. And I got really tired of seeing myself in those pictures. Usually I was taking the pictures, so I'm not luckily too much there. But when I see myself, it really irritates me because there I was in paradise with the small children and happy and heavy. And then when I see my face, I get, I remember my mind, and I was worrying about my credit card and my visa and my passport and whether someone would fall off a cliff. And I wasn't in that moment. Mm. So I got sick of that. And then I realized that, I, and then you get in the moment looking at the picture. So then I realized that when you attain nirvana, then every moment in the past will be nirvana. You know? And, you know, that one guy said this great thing about the reintegrating of memory today, that uh, Dublin, Dublin or whatever his name is, the guy, the, this ecstasy guy. He said that people have to reintegrate and reconstruct the memory after they have the memory in some sort of a state. And that, that's my thing about Buddha. When Buddha attained enlightenment at the event horizon of the full enlightenment where he became infinite, 
as a being, he was able to remember infinite previous lives because he reconstituted those memories by realizing that even though he was in hell in one of them or in an animal form and being eaten by somebody or whatever it was, or in a human form being killed or giving his body away, he realized he was already in nirvana then. So then he could clearly remember it all. We don't remember our previous because we suffered so much and we didn't, we didn't enjoy dying, you know, and giving up our cherished body many, many times that we did. So there he's reintegrated. When you attain nirvana, apparently you reintegrate all your memories where it's just one uninterrupted flow of bliss. So they define it, and that's my consolation then. So I'll be, I'll be with you in nirvana later. <laughs> right. But then that'll be here, too, because then you're in all moments of time. This you know, Rick stole I'll mark it on my calendar. Yeah. What? Rick stole my question, because that was going to be one of the questions oh. I wanted to ask you, because, uh, you know, uh, Vajrayana Buddhism sets the bar very high for enlightenment. You know, uh, Jack sure. Kerouac said once that walking on water wasn't built in a day. And that, <laughs> <laughs> and that uh, you know, you've got to perfect the six paramitas and all of that oh, sure. kind of stuff. And my own teacher, my primary teacher is uh, Ken Rinpoche, Loeb Sang Set. Oh, he's so nice. Yeah, yes. he's a wonderful guy. But yeah. he'll often say when I'm t uh, helping him do a teaching or something, somebody will say, well, are you a Buddha? You know, are you enlightened? And he'll say, no, if this is a skyscraper and the Buddha is here, I'm down here on the first floor. And I always think, well, where's that put me, man? <laughs> I mean, you know, like, I'm like in the 50th basement somewhere, you know, with the, with the old last year's gloves or something like that. And I, and I think uh, from spending so much time in India that, you know, here a Baba, there a Baba, everywhere a Baba, Baba, right. that there's so many Babas there claiming I, enlightenment. I know. Do you think that might be even uh, part of the wisdom of Vajrayana to set the bar so high that you have less chance for charlatanism? Or... Yeah, I think so. But, but it's not just Vajrayana. It's even Mahayana, you know. Yeah. In other words, we, you know, for example, in academic Buddhist studies uh, realm, the big industry is to prove that Buddha was just an ordinary person. You know, he was like a Socrates, and he just dyed his toga orange, you know, and he didn't drink Ritzina. But otherwise, he was just wandering around talking to people, and he didn't know anything, you know. And therefore, enlightenment, the final goal of enlightenment is like, duh, you know, <laughs> you don't know anything, which is really... It's really our hang-up, the modern Western hang-up, that we think we're so advanced and we have all this great science, etc., and we're so neat, our great culture, and blah, 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 which is just total delusion. <laughs> we're driving the planet over the cliff, for crying out loud. We're the first group in written history that is really ready to destroy everything. And actually, we're all sitting here, not out there stopping, you know, the Exxon Mobil and the Koch brothers and things. We're not stopping them. Uh, because we just think nobody can. Everybody secretly thinks, well, maybe we'll muddle through, but there's nothing I can do. You know? That's where we're, we're conditioned to think that. And so the idea that there is this completely vast consciousness and that there is a being who is never omnipotent. Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism never claims omnipotence for Buddha, but they claim omnicompetence to deal with these difficult karmic situations that we're all co-creating. Elizabeth is always saying how we co-created, but that's the karma theory. That, and actually, God, in the Buddhist literature, God tells Buddha, he says, go teach, man. It's great that you understand what, how things work. Please go tell the human beings when something really terrible happens to them, it's not my fault. I'm not omnipotent. <laughs> I didn't create it all. I'm, I'm doing my best for everybody. I'm a really cool guy. I'm Brahma, you know, like I'm a big energy field. But I can't control everything because I'm not omnipotent. So please tell people that. Here, here's the Dharma wheel. Go teach people. There's an actual thing in Buddhist Sutra like that from God. God Buddhists don't disbelieve gods. There's plenty of them. But none of them are the big boss. You know, and neither is Buddha the big boss. But Buddha is the great teacher of how each one of us to boss our own world, take responsibility, that we're interbossing. And, and, and the real way of taking full responsibility that to save this planet is to let the women be a bigger boss. Yeah. That's the same thing. Look at that. <laughs> I know, and, that, and that's not just pandering to the California women. I really mean it. I really mean it. It was mostly men clapping, I saw. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, the point you made about ExxonMobil and the Koch brothers and all that yes. brings up an interesting point, yes. which is that um, what is the utility of spiritual 
flourishing and awakening for bringing about real social change? Is, oh, is it just we're marinating in our own subjective bliss, or can we really actually, by working on such a fundamental level, and this would be the most fundamental level absolutely. one could work on, and we know that more fundamental things are more efficacious in bringing about changes yes. on less fundamental levels, yes. is this the ultimate fulcrum through which we can modify the society profoundly? Yes. Well, His Holiness, uh, Dalai Lama's slogan is, world peace through inner peace. And uh, that, it, he there is, he's not a disciple of Rupert Sheldrake, but I consider Buddhist science likes Rupert Sheldrake a lot, and the concept of morphic resonance or morphogenetic resonance. So if you are doing well inside, and you guys, you Maharishi guys, you know, you like that in the sense of, well, you know, MIU, Fairfield, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, but well. you're no longer in that. <laughs> but no, Been but there, done that. if you have like a 40,000 person meditation squad and they yeah, go yeah. to Kosovo or they go to yeah. Sarajevo. I did that, I was in meditate, Iran for three months. And then and people yeah. calm down, and I'm sure it is true actually, although I think it may not be so quick, you know. They may, they may still squeeze off a few rounds before they cool out, <laughs> and they might blow away a few of the meditators. Yeah. So you have to be very strategic about it. But overall, I mean, what's wrong with America? America, look, in Tibet, they had no army toward the end of their last few hundred years of their existence. They had been a conquest dynasty, and they had no army. And, and all the guys, the Rambos, were in monasteries, and instead of beating up somebody else, they were banging their own head against the wall, trying to understand chunyata, emptiness, and so forth. And so they weren't perfect, and they weren't all enlightened, but they were putting a vibe out about world peace and peace in the society through inner peace, and they were happy, and therefore all that colorful Tibetan painting and the weird chanting and Om Mani Padme Hum and all that, and they inflicted that even on the Mongolians, who had had the biggest empire in history. So it proves that a country will be happier and better if they demilitarize, they, even if they were, had been a backward conquest country before that, and, they, and they're happier, but of course, 20th century, they got chewed up by the bunch of fanatic, industrialized, tribal behavior of people, Russians and Chinese in their case, and British actually in their case. And, uh, but now we're in a, in a stage where world peace to inner peace, where I think there's two levels. Like the level of the leadership is still in the 19th, in the 20th century, or I don't know, maybe 20th century BC, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but, you know, let's go conquer somebody, you know and let's build some more weapons and do all this stuff, you know, and, they, and yet massively incompetent, causing huge damage to themselves and everyone and getting nowhere at all. And whereas the masses of people, unprecedented history before the invasion of Iraq, for example, or the criminal American invasion of Iraq, you know, there were millions of people worldwide protesting that, which I think would have been unheard of in 1938 or 9, that you would have had such a reaction. So I think in the sensitivity of the masses of the humanity, wherever they're allowed to express themselves, they're against all this. And the Dalai Lama's faith about it is that that will have its impact, even where democracy is either non-existent or suppressed, as in our country by Fox News propaganda, we don't have, we're losing our democracy. And so, um, so that's, where, that's where there is a sensitivity emerging. People are becoming more sensitive worldwide, I think, in the masses. And women, wherever they can, are becoming more empowered. And the guys are becoming righteously scared. <laughs> Which is a state of, that's awakening. I'm awakened about that. I know, I know which side my bread is buttered on. Yeah. Absolutely. Even though I'm now at a back in monasticism at my age. But, but still, you know, uh, that's, that's, Biological that's, that's the thing. Of, uh, that is a genuine awakening we are seeing on this planet. So that gives me optimism, put it that way. And therefore, the inner transformation that one does, the motivation is key. You know, if you're a Theravadan, from a Buddhist point of view, if you're meditating to gain your own enlightenment only, you can do the same exact meditation, mindfulness or whatever it is, love meditation, metta meditation. If your motive is, as I'm doing this, as my mind changes, millions of people will morphically resonate with me. Not only what I might do afterwards that would be good, but right now by changing my mind, different people are changing their minds. Like one person is just slamming that door a little less loud, being a little less violent in that family row, saying a little less nasty thing, and that's radiating out, and I'm part of the radiation by being a little bit dealing with my own inner nasty self, you know? Yeah. The nasty side of my, my habitual You self. answered the next question I was going to ask. Oh, okay. Dana, you have one? Well, you know, I was thinking... Hold it close to your mouth. Okay. Uh, 
you know, I was thinking that uh, in whatever year it was, 1960-something, when Houston Smith made Requiem for Faith, remember yeah. that? Yeah. That it was really the, his own heart was broken because he had met His Holiness the Dalai Lama, and they yeah. had formed a friendship. Yeah. And now he was like, okay, we better film this and document it before it's gone forever because yeah. people don't even know what's happening to yeah. these poor people. And then uh, it was really almost like the Chinese coming into Tibet. Here was a culture most of the world didn't know about. And then displacing them to the diaspora was like putting out a fire by, you know, taking the faggots of wood from the fire and throwing them out into the woods. That's right. And then, okay, the fire's gone. <laughs> but really what you've done is set the world on fire. And to a large that's extent, true. that's been true, hasn't it? That, that, is, uh, that is true. There has been that uh, dialectical thing. but. I never liked the rationalization of the invasion and destruction of Tibetan culture but about that because, you know, it would have been, you could, they could have set the world on fire if they had their own passports and visas and get on a plane in Lhasa and fly to Los Angeles and yeah, make a movie, you know what I mean? And <laughs> they could do it without this terrible suffering that they're still undergoing, actually. They're still completely locked down. And, uh, but we have great hope in Xi Jinping, strangely, although other people have already given him up. But uh, His Holiness and I and a few people who know the past history have great hope that Xi Jinping, who has arrested the head of the secret police and a few people, very, very rough people in China, you know, on this corruption thing, that he might, if he gains full control of the, a very huge, complicated bureaucracy there, he might actually give the minority people a break. He, there, we might be seeing in our lifetimes a, an embrace between the President of China and His Holiness the Dalai Lama meaning that they're going to not try to conquer the world instead of they have because they really have two choices the the heavy duty people there the dick cheney's of china let's put it that way <laughs> the dick cheney's of china they plan and intend fully to conquer the world they feel it's their turn it was the brits in the 19th it was the americans in the 20th and their 21st century is theirs. they have said so they write books about it in china the these kind of people and but I think World War III is not really a viable option for any sane person because the weaponry is way too powerful. There can be no winner, really, of that. And uh, so that means that, that, that the other choice is join the world and don't just try to like make all the, the iPhones and make all the Walmart products and, and rip everybody off with the, uh, who are groveling to you to get huge trade deficits so they can all go bankrupt and ruin their labor market in their country and we go broke but then you just trade with them in a fair level field and then everybody has something to contribute and they'll be a great power and they'll make great movies you know i'm waiting for a great you know marilyn marilyn monroe miss marilyn monroe making dragons and tigers flying and all that i'm waiting for that <laughs> that's cool we don't have to monopolize anything if they make fun things i like to see a chinese doctor who <laughs> Definitely. They make a good one. Chinese sci-fi. You know, it'd be great. And uh, so then they just join up with us, you know. And I think that this Xi guy, Xi, Xi, which means peace in Tibetan actually, Xi, even though they, print out, they spell it X-I, but Xi could do it. And we're praying for him to succeed in doing it. But he hasn't gotten there yet. You know, uh, one follow-up question on His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, that I thought of when uh, you were making the comment about women, uh, and this guy said, I said, I saw only men clapping, and he said, we're all married. <laughs> we're all, we're all what? Had to, he said, married. we're all married. I had to clap. Uh, <laughs> Reason. to interpret what he meant. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Recently, His Holiness said, uh, somebody asked him if there could ever be a woman Dalai Lama. Yes. So you know where this is going. Yes, yeah, sure. And, uh, and His Holiness said that uh, it would be possible, perhaps, but she'd have to be attractive. No, 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 what he said, that's, that's right. But what he said was, he said, yeah, I might be a woman. He said, I think I might be born as a woman. He said, because they tend to be more peaceful in their reactions and less reactive right. than men. And then he thought for a minute, and then he said, and in that case, and he actually made a modeling gesture. He said, in that case, I'd be much more attractive. And he, he, went, he struck a pose like that. In, uh, it was in Italy near Pisa in some town there. And the Italians loved it. You know. They totally loved it. You know. Well, I'm glad you clarified it as a joke, because I know some people <laughs> just saw it in print. The Tibetans got very wrong. nervous, by the way, being a bunch of chauvinists, mostly. You know, they're still you know, nomad chauvinists. And, they're, 
And Tibetan women are famously strong, so they're a little nervous about it. So <laughs> the Dalai Lama would become one. They were a little bit upset about it. They were a little worried. You know. And Dalai Lama, of course, is an institution for women. And people totally misunderstand this Dalai Lama thing about last Dalai Lama and all this thing going on with the Chinese hardliners. And uh, because Dalai Lama has to be reborn in the endlessly. Avalokiteshvara is born infinite numbers of times in the Nirmanakaya, body of emanation of Buddha. There's no question he will not be reborn. But he means the Dalai Lama institution being responsible for the government, etc. That he has put an end to. He wants Tibet, the new Tibet to be fully democratic, as he wants China to be fully democratic. And he wants Russia to be fully democratic. And he's just hoping that Putin will start drinking a little bit more and relax and stuff. <laughs> you know, and he'll go and enjoy his villa down in the south of France, as well as his thing in Sochi, next to Stalin's house. And uh, he'll cool down, calm down, we're all hoping, you know. <laughs> Basically. And then, because that is the big struggle today, is democracy versus these different tyrannies. With theorists like Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore pretending that Asian people like the tyranny and it's more efficient in, the, in, in industrialization, the tyranny is, and therefore that's the way of the future. We have people here who don't like democracy. You know, these are these billionaires who are now funding all the like weird redneck, Super PACs. and it's really like a, not not a good thing. That's yeah, the I'm, big I'm struggle of today. You know? Since you're bringing up you know political points a lot, I, yes. I, I still I find I'm sorry, that I no, I like it. I find I that help it. I find it very interesting because yes. I am of the, the opinion that spirituality should um, kind of. If it's genuine, yes. it, sh it should ripple up into social change automatically. Yes. And, um, and I kind of, when I look at the world events and things going on, I, I try to see how it, that might be um, symptomatic of awakening consciousness in the world. I sure hope so, so, for instance, when that guy got shot in Ferguson, Missouri, and then the whole Black Lives Matter thing happened, a yeah. tragedy was kind of turned into a, um, a tool for social change. Sure. And I, we can sure. think of several other different examples. Um, so maybe, maybe you could riff on that a little bit. I mean, do you... You're, you're passionate about political things, and I, I'm yeah. not saying we should all just sit on our butts and meditate and the world will change. I think you need action on all levels. Yes, yes. So and, and one thing I've noticed is that a lot of people who in the 60s were just sitting meditating are now more passionate activists, yeah. and a lot of people who were, you know, rah-rah activists in those days and thought meditation was a waste of time have turned to spirituality. So there's sort of a, a merging of those two so. things. Yes, I do hope so. And, uh, but, you know, the, the real activists, in my opinion, is that the quest of happiness, actually. In other words, we need social activism of really happy people. Yeah. Go down there and tell, like, it's the Koch brothers or, like, some other turkey, you are such a jerk and you are making up the planet with a big grin. <laughs> and why don't you, like, wear a false nose or be a clown or something or, like, you know, have some fun instead of going around, like, being, like, a tea party, fake tea party guy or whatever it is. And so there's a, and they feel that you don't hate them. You don't resent the bad guy. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh is so beautiful and brilliant. I was, somebody read me a thing, and he, he's around, he's in San Francisco now, by the way, and he's recovering, actually. He's getting therapy, and he's like, getting a little better. He moves his hand now. He had a stroke but he's still or not talking or? much. Did he have a stroke? Oh, he had a tremendous one in France, yes, uh -huh. uh, last summer. And, uh, or whenever it was, you know, maybe last spring. And uh, he has this beautiful thing where he says, I am the poor person who's, bo who's, you know, who's poor child, whose body is like sticks and everything, and I am the dictator who has ruined the economy of that Af African country and has made that child into things, but I am both of them. I am all of them. So it's a new kind of thing. The worst kind of thing is an activist who hates the ruling class and is willing, thinks, you know, power, barrel of a gun. And we've already seen in the 20th century that those kind of people, when they do get the power, they're worse than the previous one because they get it by violence and then they become more closed off from people and more unethical and unethical and make calculations and then they kill off this people and that people. Mm -hmm. And they become addicted to the power because they're afraid if they give it up, someone will get them because they become like that. So we need a happiness revolution. People have to be happily, but happily, happily resisting, happily resisting, happily speaking out, happily voting. In our country, well, less than 50% of the people vote in the last election. Yeah. And then the Republicans have 30 states wired to rig, rig the vote. Right. So there's only 20 states in which the vote was counted properly. So people have to really be happy, go out and get their driver's license, help people get the driver's license in those states that passed the unconstitutional laws supported by the Reagan uh, Supreme Court, criminally irrational Supreme Court, self-impeached Supreme Court uh, majority, and, and happily deal with these people, you know. 
go and tickle like Justice Thomas, you know. Tickle him. <laughs> hey, what do you mean no special affirmative action? I'm going to affirmatively tickle you and laugh with him and be prepared even to love a terrorist. I, I have a thing on my Why the Dalai Lama Matters book, which I consider my favorite last book, where I was asked by the publisher to put in 10 points of hope. And my 10th one said, which I used to avoid embarrassing standing ovations in lectures, where I say it's our duty as activists to be so happy that even if they kill us, we'll die happy. And the people are about to go, yay, and they go, whoops. <laughs> and I actually added to that, where I was recently, I gave a little bit activist speech, which I usually never do, but it was in Kingston, and Ralph Nader came, and Gary Nell, who both I admire tremendously, although Ralph really needs to use his Princeton educated logic to realize that lesser of evils means less evil. He can't get that into his head, you know. That's terrible, but never mind. But I love him otherwise. I love him. So I, I came up, I, I elaborated that point of hope, saying that we have to cultivate the ability, if they kill us, to, to make sure we go out with a digasm. <laughs> That's my new slogan. <laughs> and, the, and the way you cultivate that is you be very generous in your life, and you give away as much as you can give away, so that you're ready to give yourself away. And then you'll have a digasm. <laughs> even though they, they vaporize you with an IED or whatever these weird things they call it, you know, or whatever they call those bombs, you know. So your, um, so your ten points of hope. Yeah. Uh, I was going to ask you, um, are you optimistic? I mean, you, you're yes. obviously tuned into world events, and there's yes. a lot, there's a lot of ways of looking at th the way things are going, which are not. Oh, very, uh, you mess. know, it's a mess. yeah, global warming could do us in, loose nukes could do us in, there's any number of things that could do us in, Putin is doing genetic that, engineering right. could do us in, so are you optimistic? Do you, do you sort totally of see a optimistic. bright, shining horizon there someplace? Yeah, those World War II type tank top leaders, you know, like, and Putin, like, who hates gay people going around posing with his muscles in his bare chest. <laughs> you know, who wants to be admired by all the gay people he's going to execute, you know, he, he, you know, is not going to, he, the fact that this massive incompetence, his ruining of his economy, he's having to sell his gas to the Chinese at like two cents off the dollar because the Europeans are not going to buy it. I mean, the guy has wrecked everything. Now he's going to get down there, he's going to help Assad. That's a really great guy to hang out with. Oh, yes, Assad is really a wave of the future. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, I can see in a talk show, you know, with Charlie Rose, Assad, Mugabe, and Putin really having a field day about how great it's going to be. And, and it's just so silly. So in other words, and then Bush and company invading Iraq. Oh, yeah, we're going to get Iraq. And Cheney saying we're going to pay for it all with their oil. And, it, and there were total disaster and trillions of dollars of waste, not to mention millions of people's lives destroyed and ruined by that crime. So how does this relate to so, optimism? No, that's so massively incompetent. <laughs> it's so incompetent and so impossible. That it's doing itself in. the fabric of the human beings and the Arab Spring and the whole thing. They keep desperately getting on their tanks and acting like they're going to control, control everything. They are very destructive, but you know, they can't escalate. What, what they would like, that group, which would serve them and their agenda, would be a world war. It, Marxian analysis is very correct. It's time for another world war because there's no demand in the global economy. They have overcapacity. So direct a lot of things, destroy them, then there's more demand, you have to build them again. That's the sort of laissez-faire radical capitalist cycle, right? But you can't have the world war anymore. Everybody's got a button. They have these things that will destroy the, there is no winner. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna have to listen to their wives. <laughs> honey, honey, if you press that fucking button, oh, excuse me, if you press that damn button, you can cut that out. If you uh, press that damn button, don't come home. <laughs> there will don't be no home. home. <laughs> no, no, nothing for you. Have you read, uh... Even the mistresses will say that. Get lost. Putin, I'm not you having think, your radioactive... Do you think this pressure, that uh, seven... In se here. Uh, uh, did you ever think about... <laughs> This is the best Buddhist stand-up I ever saw. I got to tell you. Uh, advanced, advanced senil Buddhist senility, perhaps. Hey, man, Uma's got nothing on you. You. Uh, Buddhism has talent. That would be an interesting show to see. Uh, 
do you ever think that, uh, you know, there's 7.2 billion people on the planet, we've turned the heat up on the planet so high, really, have yeah. turned it up, uh, that that's creating a pressure that we've got to, we've either got to wake up or, or self-destruct that. Uh, well, that's why I'm a big fan of monasticism. Yeah. You know, that's a way of reducing the numbers. that curve. Like, I, I, I was at some conference uh, somewhere with a bunch of, like, of these type of people, you know, the elite, our elite. And some McKinsey guy got up there who announced himself as, I'm the most expensive consultant on the planet. <laughs> and then he said, you know, in a few years we'll have nine billion people on the planet. He was talking to these kind of capitalist types. And he was saying, isn't that great? We'll have three billion more in the middle class. So then I said to him, I said, if you had three billion people more in the middle class on this planet, the way middle class behavior is defined today, no one would have any oxygen to breathe, and at least three or four billion at the bottom level would be dead. So you could define the middle class like that. It's the most silliest, uninformed thing. And that same guy later at dinner, my wife got a hold of him, and he tried to claim to her that the Gulf of Mexico is all clean now. <laughs> oh, it's so nice and clean. And you know those those crayfish. That's really great. It's a little has a little flavor. You know, like petroleum. Like, you know, it's more flavorful than crayfish. Not just some, what a like a moron. And the guy, the most expensive consultant. I mean, really, we need some Dharma consultants out there. You know, but they, and they'd be cheaper. They'd be cheaper probably. As I see it, there's a, a kind of. I, Sorry, sorry to be such. No, no, you're great. I, I'm just I'm being the straight man, and, yeah. but you just you'll take it away. Um, <laughs> as I see it, there is uh, a kind of a epidemic of spiritual awakening taking place in the world. At least an interest so. in spiritual awakening, but actual awakenings. I mean, uh, world consciousness seems to be rising in a great many or collective consciousness in a great many people, and I'm wondering whether you think that that might be some kind of cosmic response to the dire predicament. In other words, that that nature has a way of uh, balancing the scales and things have gotten so out of balance that the upsurge we see in spiritual awakening is actually some kind of divine intervention, some kind of response in order to uh, avert, well, heyam dukam nagatam, to, to avert the danger which has not yet come. I do think so, I have to say. I have a kind of dumb faith somewhere in there along with the whole science that uh, I do think the Cold War, for example, especially when we had such emotional and awakened giants like Nixon and Brezhnev and Mao involved and Kissinger and other. Well, Kissinger was quite liberal when he was young. I recently found out. I was surprised. But anyway, when we have that kind of people, that they didn't have at least some sort of some level of nuclear exchange, I believe was their divine intervention there. Yeah. And when I say divine intervention, of course, I mean in the Buddhist sense, of like what we might think of as angel type angelic, very, very powerful being, sort of invisible to ordinary beings, and uh, usually, and, but very, very powerful getting in there. And uh, I even had a, like a dream once about it, which was very, very convincing to me, that dream, uh, where a sort of fierce Tibetan angel, like a, what the seraphim really originally were, you know, seraphim and cherubim were in ancient Christianity and Judaism were very ferocious kind of angels. And where one of them, who had this flaming hair, you know, jammed that hair into all kinds of electronic circuits and blocked some button pushers mm -hmm. at a certain moment in our history. I, I saw it in a dream in the year that it may have happened. And, uh, and so I sort of, you know, I feel that. I feel that there, there are very fallible, the way our political process works and the way our media works is not good enough to rule out, uh, to really fit with my mother's faith. My mother had a faith that really bad politicians and bad rulers would be exposed by, by media exposure. And people would, although they would, maybe some people would get swept away in a McCarthy type mis message, they would see the face of the guy whispering to Roy Cohn and being whispered at, and, and that would then turn people off to these kind of negative people. Mm -hmm. But I think in her, the her day, that may have been the case, you know. But now there's all this fakery that goes on, you know, that maybe that's no longer the case. But I do think that we, are, we have been protected at that ultimate level by some sort of semi-magical beings. And definitely in the Mahayana Buddhism, not just Vajrayana, uh, Dana, but Mahayana, Vajrayana is really just the esoteric, esoteric part of Mahayana. Right, right. Mahayana Buddhism, the power of enlightened beings, 
of compassion, not omnipotent power, but the power to regulate and try to prevent people from harming themselves in the worst possible way, is immense. It's seen as really immense. It's like, that's the kind of vision we are right here and now, in every atom of us, at the chair and the floor and all the people, there's a Samantha Bhadra Bodhisattva who's saying mantras, you know, and it's everywhere, in every atom here, like a hologram, you know. And that, and that holographic presence of that positive energy, of loving energy, of satisfying people, of getting them to restrain their worst possible actions is really powerfully there to intervene in the worst possible case. And well, I, uh, I do believe that. I don't know if... So uh, we're in good hands, I think. I don't know if you heard about this uh, or if somebody in the audience did. Uh, this is a book and it's called something like The Man Who Saved the World. And uh, mm -hmm. he was, last week, he was at the World Parliament of Religions in Salt Lake City oh. and I got to hear him speak, uh, a Russian man. Oh. And there had been an event where the radar had fed him the wrong information. Now, if you've heard the story, I see some heads nodding. Mm. And uh, he was in the position of pushing the button that Ooh. if you if you see this radar readout, then that means the United States has launched missiles and you have to take action. Right. There won't be time to notify the, right. you know, uh, the powers that be and get permission. And he claimed he had an intervention. He claimed that a voice came to him and a being came to him and you know, it's a dangerous position to go against that command, especially when you don't know whether yes, the bombs yeah. are coming or not. Yeah. And he didn't push the button. Oh, good man. <laughs> and um, so it's exactly a, you know, an example. You know that your, verse in the Gita where it says, Lord Krishna says, I come to uphold Dharma and destroy the wicked. Do you, do you kind of see mass destruction taking place as society no, undergoes no, a big want shift? we destroy or? the wicked. We never want to destroy the wicked. We want the, the Buddhist way is you take the wicked and you chain them in a chair, and you expose them to a non-duality conference for maybe six months <laughs> or a year, and you, and you show them all sorts of things, and you, know, you give them massages, and they ralph them, and, you know, you, and they basically give them some MDMA combined with a little acid, and, and maybe, a, maybe, maybe a DMT suppository if they're really hard case. And then they straighten out, they, they cool down, you know, we don't want to destroy them, we want to destroy the wickedness and get that out of them, you know, but no, we don't want to destroy any wicked. Uh, you know, sometimes maybe if you don't have the chair to put them in and they're about to behead you or something, yeah. then, you know, you might shoot from the hip, but... Did you ever read but, and over... And then in that case, you, if you shoot from the hip, you should engage with their afterlife, they're in the between state and help them get to like a nice prep school or something, or <laughs> get, get to be reborn by, be reborn as the child of Maurizio and Zaya, you know, and, and be a non-duality baby. Uh, okay. We have a few more minutes. Um, <laughs> Stan Groff is coming in after this. Okay, good. Um, he's, oh, Stan Groff, is a, he's a bodhisattva talking mm -hmm. about angelic intervention. After Nixon and those weirdos made war on drugs and made made acid totally illegal. He kept getting people alcoholic stoned in Maryland there and he cured like thousands of them, I think. He's like a total saint bodhisattva. And then after he didn't even have that, he got them like huffing and puffing for half an hour <laughs> to like simulate the same thing, get their adrenochrome going from their adrenal glands. What a bodhisattva. I admire that guy 100%. Me too. <laughs> um, well, you know, if a question while you're, you're looking for one, Rick, that, you know, go, going back to... Uh, the enlightenment idea yes. and the enlightenment idea. A lot of times, and especially at a conference like this where people come from different traditions, Sufi yes. tradition, Hindu traditions, yes. Kundalini traditions, yes. various Buddhist traditions, uh, they're talking about non-dualism, but they're often using the same term but meaning something different by it. Sure, sure. And so uh, when we say the Tathagata, the one who's gone to that, the Tatha, then uh, in the Hindu tradition, when we say tattvamasi, thou art yeah. that, then uh, where do you see the atman anatman question there? I'm curious. I'm sure problem. you've answered this before. It, it's is it the been, same that or is it a different it's, it's that? The, it's the, yes, it's the same. It is almost the same that. Like all Buddhist questions, yes and no is always the answer. <laughs> it is almost the same. And, uh, and for example, Shankaracharya, as I think I mentioned, I don't, I don't, I can't remember where I said what, that's getting that age, but uh, Shankaracharya is really very much the same as Nagarjuna. And, and he, you know, with his Nirguna Brahman idea, unqualified Brahman. 
because what unqualified Brahman and Shunyata do, do is they totally relativize all pseudo-absolutes. So therefore, that's the key, the non-duality is that this relativity is the absolute. So therefore, the wisdom becomes total, absolute, dedicated compassion and love for every being. There's no hanging out in some vast space where I'm, like, I'm God and like forget about you untouchables. That doesn't happen. And therefore, the Brahmins, after a while in the Vedanta, they got Vishishta Advaita and finally Dvaita Advaita. You know? In other words, they went back against Shankara because they wanted some absolute, because they wanted to still keep their caste superiority as an absolute themselves. So that's where there is a difference. And where, like, just to give an example from a Buddhism point of view, we have a Tibetan Westerner who became, who was a Tibetan monk for a long time and who then got even a kind of maybe honorary geishi degree, which is a sort of a study degree. And then he had an experience, because he'd probably never run into MDMA or whatever, but he had an experience where he meditatively disappeared. He totally disappeared. What they call space-like equipoise samadhi, he actually achieved. So then, he, would, of course, he came back, because there is no place to be disappeared, really, eh? except one of those formless realm states, which is just a state. It's still a relative state, although it seems very absolute. But then he decided he was enlightened because he disappeared. So then, and he was back just hanging out, and then when he passed away, I, I suppose he'd be permanently disappeared. Gee whiz, like every materialist scientist is going to permanently disappear just by dying. So I don't know why he thought that was so great. But then he went around behaving like he was a holy and everybody should worship him. He was a big guru because I'm enlightened. He got, in other words, trapped in the demon ghost cave of thinking I'm enlightened because I disappeared. You know, but I like to say everybody's enlightened. Everybody disappears every night. <laughs> you turn off the lights, you lose consciousness, you dong, you're unconscious. Then maybe you rise in the dream, then again you disappear, then you wake up in your coarse body, as they would say. So disappearing is just no ultimate reality. Now, if you, dis if you misunderstand who Brahma is, and if you misunderstand who Paramaatma is, and you forget neti neti, naiti naiti, that Paramaatma is not anything personal. It's not your personal, absolute, right, disappeared right. state, which people do make that misunderstanding. Then they think, oh, that nirvikalpa samadhi, that time of being extinct, they even misunderstand nirvana as being extinction. And when I was extinct, then I'm enlightened. So the whole thing is everybody should get extinct. And therefore, I don't need to be compassionate. When I'm back hanging out until I die, and then I'm permanently extinct, I'm not going to fix this untouchable. I'm not going to affirm my equality with these less fortunate people. If I'm a male Brahmin, I'm not going to have my wife do the Vedic ceremony because she's my superior in wisdom, right? So, so my, the non-duality that both the greatest Hindus need, because they are half Buddhists, all of them, you know? You know, but there was ninth never thought of Vishnu. I'm always scolding them. They only go, Rama and Krishna. They never say Hari Buddha. <laughs> but they, actually, they do, and they can, a few of them. And yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, I have seen them do it by when they're challenged. But the point is that the ones we need, both Buddhists and Hindus, are the ones who define non-duality as the non-duality of wisdom and compassion. And they are really bent on changing the status of those with, who suffer. And, and that's what Brahma does. And Brahma wants to do that. He told Buddha, he said, go tell people when they suffer, it's not my fault, I'm not omnipotent. Help them. And Brahma is, Brahma is a great Bodhisattva, actually, usually, most Brahma. We have There's to many Brahmas in many universes simultaneously. We have to I'm wrap sorry. it up. I no, know. that's okay. It'd be good to end with we one more laugh. We didn't talk about the gas pump. No, I we'll, want we'll do that. to have a Tesla. <laughs> oh, good idea. <laughs> All electric. Thank you very much, Bob. It's, it's really been fun. Okay, thank you. It's been great. You. It's an I honor.